Well, if you would open your Bibles to the most popular Psalms. And it's not Psalm 23. Psalm 110. I'm going to pray. And we're going to die, really dive into the word. Father, we thank you for your word, not just words on pages, but the living word, King Jesus. And so Jesus, you, the living word, may you draw our hearts to you. May the word be seed, an engrafted seed that we receive into our hearts. May it bear much fruit in our lives. And so Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see Jesus open our hearts to receive the seed of the word so that in receiving the word in faith, may we bear much fruit and in bearing fruit, may we glorify Jesus. That this is an hour, a moment for the church to rise. And I thank you, Jesus, that it is not in our own power and certainly not for our own glory, but it is for your glory and through your power that we fulfill your will in this day and in this age. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm in a series that I've entitled The Church in Prayer. And uh, if you've missed either of the two weeks prior to this, this may be the first you're with us or the first you've joined us um, online, uh, please go back and listen to those two. I really need to avoid repeating some things uh, because today is very important to me and and I need to stay on track for your sake and for mine. Um, But uh, my my motive, my purpose for doing this series is I do believe this is an hour for the church. It's a moment for the church uh, and that the Lord wants to do something mighty and powerful in and through his church, which also brings an equal amount of concern for me. Concern that the church in today's hour, especially in the United States, is behaving and acting just like the world, but just with a religious veneer over it, just with religious terminology, acting out of fear and anxiety, acting out of power grabs rather than by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I wanna try to trace that to some roots so that we in the church can be faithful to this moment, that you and I can serve our purpose in this generation that you and I were born in this day and in this time and in this hour on purpose for a purpose. You are not an accident, and I don't just mean that by principle, I mean you're not an accident for this moment. That this moment in human history is a moment you were born for. God intentionally put you on this planet in this moment for a purpose, and I don't want us to miss that purpose. And so trying to, to reach deep into the roots of that, I believe that the most important thing I can teach you is how to pray. And that the church needs to see that, that the most powerful thing it can do is pray, specifically pray the word. That it's in prayer and the word that if I can teach you how to pray and engage in the word and the more I can teach you to do those at the same time, that is my job. It is why I'm here. It's why we pastor. Pastors need to spend most of their time doing that, not just giving encouraging TED Talk style sermons that make you feel good but don't change your life. It's with that that I might poke you a little bit today. I might challenge you. If you're not wearing steel-toed boots, I'm really sorry. Because <laughs> this, this, I want to encourage you in faith, what it means to be in faith that I've covered the last couple weeks, that faith is not some manipulation tactic. It's not a transaction we engage in with God. It's covenant relationship with the living God and cooperative obedience to his word. And if we can learn that, that's simple, but not easy. If we can learn that, I do believe you and I can be faithful in this moment. It's wise stewards of the time we've been given. But we need to exercise and grow and mature in that faith, which means we need to see what prayer is for and that we don't need to see prayer as just some side project that we do when we feel like it or we do when we have the margins for, but it is one of the most important things we can do. We have to check our own motives in prayer, that the primary purpose of prayer is not for you to get God to do what you think God should do. The primary purpose of prayer is for relationship. And in that relationship, we are to be transformed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that transformation today. We have to see prayer as primarily about being with God, not trying to get something from God. 
and all the other things that happen in prayer, like growing and trusting God for his promises, enacting his will, it stems from these motives. It stems from this being our primary motive is that we need to be with God because we need to be transformed. We need to know God for, for we need to know God for the sake of knowing God, not trying to know God for the sake of trying to get something in the world. And so the best way to do that that I'm an advocate for is learning how to pray the word. It's no easy task. It's not, uh, it's not something that will come naturally, but praying the Psalms has, is something I'm a strong advocate for. And I'm advocating for you to do it and not always have it figured out because you're gonna get confused. You're gonna get like wondering what in the world's going on here and how do, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, and it's in time that you start learning and I want you to learn. And so I'm, I'm, I'm simply sharing some of my own journey and some of my own learning and how just simple Psalms like this, these short seven verses in Psalm 10 or five verses in Psalm 93, what we talked about two weeks ago or 11 verses in uh, Psalm 46, how these actually begin to transform us as we learn how to pray them uh, and learn how to pray them even without first understanding them. It's in praying them and learning them and then me sharing things like this that'll help you grow in that. And another note on just what I'm trying to accomplish here, there's many ways that you can deliver uh, sermons and most, what most people in today's age are familiar with is a topical type sermon. You take a topic, especially one that people have a felt need for and you, you, you trace certain Bible verses and scriptures and stories to, to try to understand that topic and grow in that topic and I'm, I'm a fan of that, I love that. One of my favorite things to do is to show you uh, threads that weave through all of scripture, things that are just under the surface that if you'll see them, it unlocks new revelation in the whole Bible. And then there's another way of, of teaching, which I've, I've pulled for this particular series, is to slow down and park in one particular place. And if you can learn what's happening in this one place, really dig deep, not have full understanding, not know everything, but truly dig deep, it begins to have a transformative effect on you, allowing the Bible to speak on its own terms rather than trying for the Bible to speak to you on your terms. And a lot of times, topical preaching can sometimes come across that way. It's not always, it, it's not always happening, but a lot of times it's like, I want to learn what I want to know, so I will use the Bible to speak to me on my terms. And you gotta be careful with that. And so I'm trying to teach you how to park and just let the scripture speak to you. And what I, what I wanna do today uh, is an impossible feat, and so I'm not going to try to do everything in my head and heart that I'd like to do for you because Psalm 110 is the most quoted Psalm in your New Testament. It's quoted verbatim, verses from Psalm 110 verbatim, seven or eight times. No other Psalm, no other Old Testament verse even comes close. And it's alluded to more than 15 times. And that's the obvious allusions. Then there's hidden double and triple meanings that your New Testament is full of that brings all these out. So these seven verses was the most influential prayer of the first century church and the apostles. The apostles understood the work and person and events in Jesus's life through the lens of Psalm 110. If you're looking at a mountain range of Old Testament verses, one of the prominent mountains of your Old Testament is Psalm 110. It might be the most prominent since it's the most quoted in the New Testament. And we miss the power of this because we're not looking, we're not looking right. We like things to, to fit in my worldview, so we like Psalm 23, it makes us feel good, right? So let me ask this question that, that we'll base this on and I, I might have to move quick, but I will tell you that the notes that I have put together for, that are on the app and that are online, um, they are, extensive uh, and if you're reading them you're thinking how is he going to cover this I am not uh, that is for you who are good Bible students who want to dig deep um, there are darn near over a hundred verses that I've put in there of quotes and references and tie-ins uh, and including at the end of the notes just a verse by verse little quick commentary on certain things that are cited in other places of the New Testament. You have to read large portions of the New Testament to understand these simple verses. And so to say I could get it to you in one single sermon is stupid. <laughs> I'm not even gonna try, but I do wanna poke you a little bit on why I think it is to our detriment 
that Psalm 110 has lost its prominence in the Psalms and in our Old Testament and our New Testament understanding of who Jesus is because the apostles saw Psalm 110 shaping how they see Jesus. Two thirds of the book of Hebrews is just primarily about two verses from Psalm 110. And Hebrews is dense, very dense. And you could trace about nine chapters out of the 13 chapters in Hebrews to just two verses from Psalm 110. So to say that, to say it's important is an understatement. Uh, and, but I wanna hit how I see that this is important for today, for right now in the day and hour we live. It might not sound very personal to you, but it is still very important in today's age. So Psalm 110, let me read it and then I'll just ask a few questions to get you in the framework. Psalm 110, verse one. The Lord, and when you see Lord, all caps, that's the covenant name, Yahweh. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That is the most quoted verse in the New Testament. Three three of the four gospels quote it. Hebrews quotes it, Paul quotes it. Verse two, the Lord, Yahweh, sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. I imagine there's a few phrases in there that maybe unsettle you, uh, disrupt you a little bit, uh, and it's supposed to. And nor will I explain every line, every word, every phrase in this, in this chapter. Again, a lot of the notes that I put together digs a lot into some of those. But I want, I want to get you to see the overall impact of this and how it works together and how it shapes our thinking and transforms us to act properly in today's age. And we do that through learning to pray. I'll ask it from a question standpoint. What constitutes the center of your life? What I mean by that, what being the center of your life is, what is the center of gravity of your life that everything else in your life, all the details, all of the issues, all of the challenges, all the desires that you have, it revolves around this central, this central aspect of your life. Now, most of you are good church people, and you know that if a preacher ever asks a question in church, you just say Jesus, because even if you're wrong, you sound good. Um, and, and that might be the case. But if I hired a private investigator (laughs) to watch you uh, day after day for about a month and they accumulated the evidence about what what they believe objectively constitutes the center of your life, would they find Jesus to be the center? My, My suspicion in my own life often is no, they would not find Jesus at the center. Um... And, you know, we have to face up, we have to face the music on that one. Uh, that we have a, a constant gravitational pull away from Jesus, whether we like it or not, whether we try to or not, away towards self. That if I venture to guess what most people center their lives around, knowingly or unknowingly, not everybody's malicious in this, it would be self to be self-centered, put my wants, my needs, my desires at the center and everything else including Jesus revolves around that. And as long as Jesus conveniently keeps my wants, my needs, my desires at the center, I keep him safely in the gravitational rotation. But as soon as he challenges me on those things, then I'll just put him further off into the periphery into my spiritual life, but not my actual life. If following and serving Jesus became illegal, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you? And so we, specifically in America, we need to be asking different questions. We need to be challenged of what constitutes the center and what is egocentric. Now, let me take a pause and try to do some cultural analysis real quick. 
Um, there's lots in my head and heart about understanding culture and the times we live in. I, I do my best to prayerfully think through and discern the times. And there's a few things I feel confident in being able to talk about, being able to maybe give you perspective on, and there's a number of things that I just don't feel ready yet, whether it's my own boldness or, or rather I'm just being insecure and I haven't figured it out enough, uh, controlling the information enough in my head to speak confidently about it. But there are a few cultural things that I do wanna press just a bit, uh, and that is how we are self-centered. Uh, if I'd have just taken it about 10 years ago, I would have mostly said that uh, the challenge of self-centeredness is in America specifically, and this in other parts of the Western world specifically as well, uh, being self-centered looks like radical individualism that I am an island in myself, I am my own, I am me and I exist in and of myself for myself and so everything revolves around me, what I want, what I need, what I desire. I arrange the, my life to be about me. And again, many people don't do that consciously. They don't do that maliciously. It's just, it's just the gravitational pull of culture that we think it really is all about you, all about me. And this radical individualism is all about arranging my life, arranging even society to structure politics and community and business and economy that best suits me and what I want. That kind of radical individualism though has morphed into a different kind of radical ideology and that is what I, I term, it's not a term I think I've heard, but radical tribalism that it's not just radical individualism anymore. What we see now that's been under the surface for about 70 years, what we see now at the surface is a radical tribalism where it's about my group, me and my tribe, what's good for me and my tribe and structuring society to best suit what's good for me and my tribe. My identity is a group identity that I, I am who I am only because I'm in this subgroup and I pit this subgroup against this other subgroup. And that kind of tribalism, now the radical versions of that are what's coming up above the surface that's being seen. And let me just tell you, both radical individualism that many people are guilty of and radical tribalism that not as many but still very vocal is both self-centeredness. It's both arranging life and society around the self, around me. And we need disrupted. We need challenged. We don't just need reminded, we need to be instructed. That challenges our self-centeredness, our radical individualism and our radical tribalism because to fight one is not to jump in the other ditch. The church needs to remember that we don't just exist on some right left political spectrum. There is an up and down. There is a moral absolute. And the church doesn't need to find itself to set in its ways on this political spectrum without recognizing we exist from a higher authority, the kingdom of God. Which means we need the self to get uncentered. And Psalm 110 brings us all into sharp focus that it radically uncenters the self. For it to be quoted as much as the apostles used, utilized it to understand the work and life of Jesus. We need to see how this psalm specifically uncenters the self. It gives us, it rescues us from being so self-centered and focused, but it also re-centers us on the solid ground of God's activity and his speaking. So in prayer, we have to learn to stop asking the selfish questions first. God, what are you saying to me? What are you doing for me? And to just start asking, God, what are you saying in Christ, in the word? Regardless of my perspective, regardless of my agenda, what are you saying in Christ? And what are you doing in the body of Christ, the global capital C church? to where both the individual and the tribe begin to be merged in a kingdom, a kingdom framework, not a human philosophy framework. What are you saying in Christ? What is your word for today? Not for me, but for today. Psalm 110 
drew the apostles' attention to see God speaking and acting on his own terms, not on the terms we want for him. It's framed around two acts of divine speaking. Verse one, the Lord says. Verse four, the Lord swears or has sworn. Those two oracles frame the, the two stanzas of this psalm and just a little Bible trivia nerd stuff. Um, in Hebrew, they're equally balanced, 74 syllables each stanza. And what it was is the apostles hunger, they developed a hunger and an insatiable appetite to hear the word of God and hear the word of God on its terms, not what we project upon it. Psalm 110 became their favorite prayer that centered their attention on the word of God and involved their lives in the work of God. In the first three verses, you see what is God speaking as Genesis 1 spoke creation into existence. Psalm 110 is speaking the Messiah into existence and the, the seminal activity of God speaking is setting the Messiah up as the king of all. Psalm 93, we looked at a couple weeks ago that God reigns, God is in charge, God is sovereign. Now how did God enact his sovereignty? Through the Messiah. And here, specifically in Psalm 110, the throne of God and the throne of the Messiah merge into one. Now, this is where, man, if we just had weeks on end to dig and you were into this kind of stuff, which I've just ventured to guess not everybody is, uh, tracing the spinal cord, the backbone of your Old Testament, um, that your Old Testament is one unified story that leads to Jesus. Jesus is the climax of the Old Testament story. The spinal cord that ties the whole thing together is God's covenant, where God binds himself to his word for a group of people. Genesis 7, 8, 9 is God's covenant with all humanity, God's covenant with Noah for all humanity, where he asks nothing from humanity. He just says, I swear, I promise not to flood the earth again. God's covenant with Abraham, calling Abraham out of the many tribes and nations in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. Then God's covenant with Israel, a people for himself. He, put, he drew into himself Exodus 19 specifically, but Exodus 19, 20 to about 22. But then the climax of the covenants is God's covenant working with a single person and then that single person, his ancestry, and that's God's covenant with David that if you write down 2 Samuel chapter seven, it's one of the mountain peaks of your Old Testament. You wanna understand your Old Testament, you gotta understand 2 Samuel seven, where God binds himself in covenant with David and his ancestors. And the Psalms, like Psalm two, Psalm 45, Psalm 72, Psalm 132, uh, Psalm 89, uh, are all ways of fleshing this out, including Psalm 110, where God speaks that this king will come and will be the highest king of all and will enact God's rule that we looked at two weeks ago, that God is in charge and God will rule in this world and he overcomes all the chaos. How is God going to do this? Psalm 110 says it's through this Messiah. It's through this Lord and he will rule. So what is God doing? He's ruling through the Messiah. And if you look at the, the first line of verse three, how do people get in on this? It says in the first line of verse three, your people will offer themselves freely. Your people will offer themselves freely. He simply is ruling and part of his ruling, he invites his people to participate in that rule drawing them, not coercing them. Coercion, manipulation, intimidation, those are all demonic. And what we're seeing on a national scene is a particular ideology in the name of justice. This ideology is using intimidation and violence to coerce people into compliance. And it's demonic. 
It doesn't matter what, it actually doesn't even matter what the end is. That is demonic and will not accomplish any godly end. But let me just also say that any kind of manipulation and intimidation from a pulpit that a pastor uses Bible and law and God's word to coerce you or manipulate you or intimidate you into thinking a certain way is also demonic. It is not Christ's rulership. Christ's rulership is just what it is. It's true and it's final. Then we get the choice on how we relate to it. And the invitation to each of us, as said here, worked out through the life of Jesus, is simply submit. Not be intimidated, not be coerced, not be condemned. Just submit. We submit to his rule. And in submitting to his rule, we then can enact his rule. Now, here is where I, I, I again, I'm still working on my, my clarity and my boldness on how to address some social philosophy things. Things that are happening that there is a, so, a, 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 a philosophical framework for that if, we, if you don't understand that framework, you're not gonna understand how to combat it because right now, what, what we are seeing is not a political battle. It looks like it is, but it's not. It's first a spiritual battle. And if we can't see that, then we're, our eyes are not open and I need to just encourage you, open your eyes. It is a spiritual battle. But that spiritual battle has worked its way into generations, plural, at least 70 years. We can trace it back to about 100 years, 120 years. It has went from a spiritual battle to a, a philosophical battle. It is a certain mindset, a perspective, a worldview that has been around for at least a strong 70, 80 years. And it's just now coming to the surface. And part of that, we call it identity politics. Um, you can call it intersectionality, is what it's often called. And I'm telling you, not only is it unbiblical, it's demonic. Because what it does is it arranges society in randomly selected subgroups. And who knows who gets to select these subgroups? But apparently there's some powers that be that selects the subgroups around race, around gender, around sexual identity, and it just selects whatever these subgroups are and then arranges the subgroups without any kind of understanding of the individual, just simply through group identity, arranges these subgroups into a hierarchy of oppression where the highest is the oppressors and everybody else is the oppressed. And the, 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 the lower you are on the oppression or the stronger, the more oppressed you are, the more you should have. And, and the more the, the oppress, op, oppression should be um, obliterated and the oppressed come to power. It's called social Marxism and it's demonic. It isn't to say that there is no oppression in the world, that there aren't people that are oppressed and people that are oppressors. It isn't to say that our world is totally just and now, because of this framework that's making up injustice, now we need to ignore it. No, no, there is injustice. It's just how it's solved is through a, a, a demonically inspired philosophical framework. See why I'm a, I'm a little skittish? Because now I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. Like people are like, blah, 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 I get to the point. <laughs> no, it's very serious. And uh, because we have not been aware we don't know how to combat that kind of spirit. We either try to fight fire with fire, so to speak. Um, we, we don't know exactly how it works, and so we, we get intimidated by it. And again, this is, and again, I'm not trying to give you philosophy, I'm teaching you how to pray. Because that verse three frames so much for me that the kingdom of God as we looked at in Psalm 93, verse five, how is God's rule enacted in the world? Psalm 93, verse five, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits or adorns your house, O Lord, forevermore. God's word enacts God's rule. And in enacting God's rule through the word, the people of God in obedient submission 
to the word are adorned or beautified by God's holiness. And it's that holiness that is beautiful and it draws others. It doesn't coerce others. That's why all these movements in in the church world about holiness is almost always just completely missing the point. But it isn't to say that holiness isn't a big deal and isn't important, but it is holiness, not our philosophy, not our doctrine, though philosophy and doctrine are very important and I, I do want us to pay attention to them and grow in them, but it is our transformation into God's holiness is what makes the church, the house, beautiful. And back in verse three of Psalm 110, your people offer themselves, why, offer themselves freely. Why? Because we see beauty in Jesus. We see beauty in the kingdom of God. We see hope. Amen. When right now, all there is is hate decrying hate. Sure. It makes no sense to me. The most intolerant bigots are the people crying for tolerance. Amen. And we don't know how to fight that. We just get mad and, and like end up fighting about it. And we don't understand where it's coming from. We don't understand how to, buy, uh, how to combat that. We have to be so captivated by the beauty of the Lord that we offer ourselves freely. And then it says, in holy garments. That in offering ourselves freely to the Lord, to this Messiah, this King, now in that relationship, we are transformed and we put on holy garments. Why? Because our holiness is terrible. Our best efforts are horrible. I mean, how many times have we tried to solve a problem and our best efforts make it worse? Our motives are pure. Our heart is pure. We see something wrong. Interpersonally, we see something wrong in a relationship or in society, we see some kind of injustice and we want to do what's right. We want to solve the problem. We want to see justice. And our best efforts bring more injustice. Right? And that's what's happening with raised fists is there, we're, there's a movement trying to fight injustice. And that there may be, I think they're looking at it wrong I think the lens that they're looking through is a wrong lens, but it isn't to say that there isn't injustice in the world. There is. But the way this movement is trying to fight for justice, if they actually win, it will bring about far greater injustice. Why? Because they're bad people? Not really. I mean, there are, there, don't get me wrong, there are, there are many people with malintent. And there are an even greater number of people who are just simply deceived. They, they honestly do not know better. They think they're doing what's right. But here's the, pro- the real problem, though, is that the problem we see with them, whoever the them is, is the problem in us. That despite our best motives, despite our best efforts, we have a strong gravitational pull towards self-centeredness. And now these movements are corrupting and they're destroying and what it really is, is we're now uncomfortable and we don't like it, so we need to fight against it. When it's not about your comfort level. None, nothing in your life is about your comfort. God, God has so little concern for your comfort that it would surprise you. Why would the Holy Spirit be described through a, 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 an, an identity? Like it's a way we understand the character of the Holy Spirit as the comforter. You do not need a comforter if you are consistently comfortable. You only need a comforter when you are uncomfortable. So God has very little interest in you being comfortable. I might say no interest, but I can't say that definitively. He just has very little very little. Uh, desire for you to be comfortable. And it's in our false comfortableness that we give in to the gravitational pull towards self-centeredness. So what do we do? Like how do we actually, what do we do about that? 
Do we just give in to injustice and say, well, I can't fix it. So we'll just let these other people who are really mad and really agitated and really active, we'll just let them make it worse. <laughs> this, is, this is my concern for the church. We don't know what to do. Because if we, if, if we actually try to do something, we might be blind to the fact that we are profoundly screwed up as well. And our best efforts might make it worse. And the church is getting dangerously deceived into thinking if we just win the next election, this will all go away. At best, at best, an election might, might turn a tide. Maybe. At worst, it just, it either ex- makes the inevitable faster or just extends it. We're fighting the wrong battle if we think we're fighting on the level of politics. And I'm not, not say, let me clarify, at this moment, right now, I'm not saying do nothing politically. I'll get to that. We'll get, we'll get to that. The problem is if we actually are aware, we realize that we are messed up and trying to fix things only makes it worse. Every husband knows this to be true. (laughs) So if there's not an option to do nothing, what do we do? You need verse four. You need a priest. You need someone to actually represent you before a holy God. You need someone, you need a priest to bring God's holiness to you because your best efforts will never, will never get you to God's holiness. Psalm 1, let me just read this to you. This is a quote by Eugene Peterson about Psalm 110. Psalm 110 established its eminence in the early Christian community by centering the self in the God who speaks. They knew that they were in a messed up world and that something had to be done about it. They also knew that their good works and good intentions were flawed in such a way that they only made it worse. And they also knew that this does not disqualify them from the work. They had been drawn into what God was doing in Christ to establish his will on earth as it is in heaven. What is Christ's work? First stanza, it's to rule. But if you look at the way this psalm is constructed, how that rule comes about doesn't happen till verse five. Because if the people who offer themselves freely to the Messiah immediately try to enact his rule, they'll only make it worse. So what do we need? We need this King Messiah to also be our priest, to also make us holy to bring about holiness and transformation in our life. Because, let me say, let me just say a real quick thing because I feel like it's important. I missed it earlier in my notes, but I want to circle back to it about justice. That there is injustice in the world and there needs to be justice, okay? Justice is a word that many people use and have many different definitions for it. And the phrase social justice, I'm not certain can be redeemed in the next decade. Not because the concept of social justice doesn't have some validity. There is justice in God that has to work its way out into society, social justice. But the phrase means so many different things to so many different people. If you use the phrase, you do need to know almost no one is defining it the way you think it should be defined because it's defined so many different ways. You need to understand something about justice. When you hear that word, listen to how it's being used. Listen to who's saying it. To give you two little ways of understanding justice. First, justice or being just is a character trait of God. God is just. Therefore, pure justice must emanate from him. But it emanates from him alone. It is the one just God that gets to define what justice is. And if you remove God 
from the definer of justice, you can define justice with whatever is just for you, whether or not it's just for others. That is the way it's being used in society today. Is in the name of justice, it's just for a group of people they think is disenfranchised or inordinately oppressed. And so justice for them, regardless of it being universal justice, doesn't matter. It's because if your framework is that the only way to structure society is in subgroups of the oppressor and the oppressed, justice is simply to dethrone the oppressor. And it's unbiblical, ungodly, and demonic. But justice matters. So what are we left with? Justice first, it's a character trait of God. But secondly, if justice, pure justice, God's justice, is going to work its way out in human society, we have to recognize humans are magnificently flawed. We're broken, fallen, sinful. Which is why The second thing about justice, if it's going to work its way from God's character into society, you need, justice cannot stand on its own two feet. You must have righteousness. Justice and righteousness are to be inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. To claim a righteousness before God, but then live out unjustly in the world it's, it's a paradox, it's a false dichotomy. It's, it's, it can't happen. If you look at the 10 commandments, the first four are about righteousness. The next six are about justice. Righteousness must be in partnership with justice and justice has to be in partnership with righteousness because who gets to define justice if we don't know who God is? It's whatever's just for me, who cares if it's just for you? And so if you look at even the enthronement Psalms, Psalm 97, we looked at Psalm 93, but Psalm 93 through Psalm 99 are what's called enthronement Psalms or God reigns. Well, if God is reigning, what does that look like? Psalm 97 looks at it like this, verse one and two. The Lord reigns, Yahweh reigns. Same thing, same beginning as Psalm 93. Let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice together are the foundation of, of his throne. You cannot have God's rulership without righteousness and justice. Justice and righteousness. That's why I am not so certain there is a such thing in in society as justice if the vast majority of society has turned its back on God. I don't care where you fall on the political spectrum between right and left. If there's no righteousness, there is no justice. Because if you are not right with God, you cannot make things right in the world. And so as much as we want things to be made right in the world, we have to understand it is us that needs to be made right first. And we can never get so arrogant to think we've got it figured out and we are just the eminence of holiness in this world. There's, there's an interesting work, and ah, it's too much time. Oh, sorry. Ah, oh, stop. Ah, I was doing so good. I can't get sidetracked. It's a really hard, this is, this is hard to talk about the finished work that's in Christ, the finished work of the cross and resurrection of righteousness and holiness, and then the ongoing work of how that works out, not, not from our spirit. Our spirit is made right with God. There's no, there's no way you can taint that. And yet, the holiness that you are in Christ must work its way out, and your flesh is magnificently flawed and doesn't always line up with who you really are. So if, you're, if, if there is ever going to be, there is no cure for racism in a political system. There's no such thing. It cannot happen. It will never happen. I don't care how many times you re- have a revolution and you rearrange society. First of all, social Marxism has, is a proven failure in history. I don't know why we're blind to our history, but that's a proven failure. But the alternative of free market societies, not just in an economy, but also a free society and individuality, Sorry, getting a little political philosophy on you. That, that even that is not the solution. Though I think it's 
the best form of government. I mean, I'll, I will put my opinion on this. Uh, I try to withhold my opinion as much as possible and show you perspective from scripture. But uh, a, a political system is, is, the highest form of a political system is a free society. And it, and it puts the responsibility on the individual, not a cultural subgroup or the government. Okay, so that's just a little side point. But regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, I'm not so sure even if I'm politically aligned with someone, but they're not right with God, there is a limitation in our partnership of how to enact justice. Amen. In the same way, 1 first, first Corinthians 6. It's 1 Corinthians 6 or 2 Corinthians 6. Um, talk about um, not being unequally yoked. And we relate that to marriage, but I mean, talk about political alliances here. You're limited on your political alliances, even if you agree politically on how you can actually bring about the kingdom of God. So get, make no mistake, a political system cannot be the carrier of the kingdom of God. You are. And you cannot offload your responsibility onto a, a, a political party or a politician. They will fail you and they'll just fail in general. So we need to be made right. And there is no way to be made right without Jesus. So let me run you through some of the places that the New Testament apostles flesh some of this out. And then we'll wrap up. Maybe sooner or later I'll have the courage to talk about social and political philosophy in the light of scripture and uh, the Holy Spirit and the, the church. Uh, I lack that courage today, just so you know. Because I have a deep desire to be understood and when you start engaging in conversations, you are increasing the likelihood of you being misunderstood. And I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that I can be a faithful voice of Jesus yet in that space. I'm trying to encourage you that there is more going on than meets the eye. And do not get caught up in solutions you think are gonna solve this problem. One election cycle will not solve this problem. Do you understand that in, it, unless Jesus comes back and you need to be prepared as if he's not coming back in your lifetime, we are in this for 50 to 100 years. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you have to think generational, not election cycle? If your vision is so narrow that everything rises and falls on every two or four year election cycles, you are, you are bound to disappointment and hopelessness and despair. You have, you have to be in this for the sake of your children's children's children. And I'm, and I'm absolutely, positively, fully convinced it's all about Jesus. Every bit of it, 100%. Even what I'm confused about currently, it's 100% about Jesus. And the only way to enact this, whatever social or political philosophy you act in and work with, if it is not subservient to King Jesus, it's wrong. Amen. I don't care how logical or how much it makes sense, it's wrong. Luke 22, this is the... Jesus before the Sanhedrin, they question him, verse 67, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he, Jesus, said to them, if I tell you, you're not gonna believe. And if I ask you, you're not gonna answer. This is a setup, he knows it's a setup. He knows it's a trap, but Jesus flips the trap. He knows what he's doing. He says, but from now on, when is that? From now on. When's now? Now. It's not then. It's now. Now on what? The Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Jesus is converging Psalm 110 verse 1 and Daniel chapter 7 in one single sentence. So to really understand this, you really got to look at Daniel chapter 7. I put all that in the notes. And Jesus flicks the trap. And so they said, are you the son of God then? And he said, you've said it. So what's he doing? He recognizes that his rulership, his kingdom, actually his ability to judge the nations. If you go back to Psalm 110, verse five, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. That's a quote, a connection to Psalm 2. 
Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against Yahweh and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart. It's the nations, they're against God. And God, you know what God's response is in Psalm 2? He who sits in the heavens laughs. He holds them in derision. He says, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Ask of me and I will give you the nations. I have said to you, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. It's all Psalm 2. Jesus is just a master at this. He recognizes that his rulership is not compromised by his crucifixion. It actually happens through. The gospel writers are so meticulous to show you that Jesus' trial and crucifixion is his enthronement ceremony. He is enthroned not in spite of the cross but because of it. And God vindicates him by raising him from the dead. And he ascends to the right hand of God. That's Daniel 7 and Psalm 110 Verse one, Peter, trying to make sense to people of the work of Jesus, ends his sermon, Acts chapter two, verse 33 to 36. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, this, this thing that you see, the Holy Spirit being poured out on the people of God, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, and he quotes Psalm 110 verse one, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. What's funny about that sermon, I need to end here, but I'm just kind of having fun. What's funny about that sermon is there was no altar call. This was the drop mic moment. He just said, you need to know the Jesus that you crucified, God has made king of the world and the Messiah of Israel. It was after that that they go, whoa, 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 what do we do about this? Then Peter's like, you need to repent and be baptized. There was no like just as I am moment. He just simply declared the truthful reality that Jesus has ascended to the highest level of the universe. Bottom line. And what are we gonna do about it? Do we offer ourselves freely? Or do we rebel like the nations? When we start to live this out, you look at the way Acts traces the people of God living this kingship out. You get to chapter 17, verse six through eight. When they, that's the people of Thessalonica, could not find them, that's Paul and his associates. They dragged Jason, that's a member of the, uh, a citizen of Thessalonica, and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Doing what? Raising a fist in revolution? No. Saying... There is another king, Jesus. Simply the church submitting to the kingship of Jesus, which works its way out in justice, what you see in Acts, feeding the poor, reconciling brokenness. No revolt, no revolution. It turns the world upside down saying, Caesar thinks he's king, but he's not. Whoever the president is, they think they're in charge. They are not. Whatever tyrant around the world, they think they're in charge and they are not. And if you, if you look at 1 Peter 4, this is pulling the second half of Psalm 110 together. And then I'll be done. We can all breathe a sigh of relief and I can just pray. You can come back next week. It's gonna be great. It's not gonna be this. <laughs> you wonder, okay, Jesus is in charge and we're supposed to live as if that's true but things don't seem to be changing like we think they should change, right? First Peter four, verse three. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Do we think that what we see in the streets in 2020 or on Netflix or on the news media, do we think that that's unique to 2020? No. Peter could just as well be describing this year. This was almost 2,000 years ago. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they, 
give, they will give an account to him, that's Jesus, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Remember Psalm 110 verse 6, he will execute judgment on the nations. Judge the living and the dead. Listen, nobody is getting away with anything. Nobody. Justice will be served. God's justice. I don't know if it'll happen in your and I's lifetime. It might seem like the wicked will win. Could look that way. I don't know. I'm going to live with the hope that King Jesus is in charge and I'm going to live it out regardless of the results. And so what do I do in the middle of all this? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that we have a message of reconciliation. What do I do? I, I call people to reconciliation with God. Do I want justice? Absolutely. I can't get that if I don't bring people to God. If people don't come to Jesus, there's no such thing as justice. There's just one group getting their way. People need to be reconciled to God. So how do I do that? I learned to pray. I learned to be a vessel of God's kingdom. I learned to submit to King Jesus every day. I learned how to repent of my selfishness and my short-sightedness. How much I'm living for getting my way, I must repent. I must repent when my words are more spiritual than my lifestyle. I have to learn how to submit to Jesus. And then I just keep putting out the message of reconciliation. You don't have to try harder or do better. Jesus has reconciled us to God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God, the Father, has made him, Jesus, to be sin, to be made sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is all about Jesus. And this moment is all about Jesus. This hour we're living in, it's about Jesus. You don't have to have it all figured out. None of us do. You don't have to have all the answers. None of us do. But if we think we're gonna see justice in this world, then we have to be devoted to more than political parties and political agendas. Do we act? Well, dear Lord, absolutely. Don't be an unwise steward of the freedom and liberty you've been given. Of course you vote. And of course we pray. And of course we act. But never get so arrogant to think that we do whatever we want just because we're Christians and like that's gonna make a difference. No, 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 we submit to Jesus. We love Jesus. We pray and we be transformed and holiness befits our life and is beautiful for the onlooking world. Let me pray. Father, I love you. And I thank you for the grace you've given us in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much that we have never been able to earn it. We don't deserve it. But man, your mercy and your grace is given to us in Christ Jesus. And so we're grateful for it. And we live with a heart of thanksgiving and willful submission to you, Jesus, that when you tell us to speak, we speak. When you instruct us to act, we obey. But may we stay constantly, humbly submissive to you, attentive to your voice, and in relationship with you, you transform us, that we live with boldness and confidence and with hope to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.